I'm, I'm Marvin Jones of the Alliance to Preserve Civil War Defenses in Washington, and we have a talk today with a presentation by Mark Leibson, who is the author of Desperate Engagement. And Mark, thank you for coming, and proceed. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> well, uh, did, did you all hear Gary give his little summary earlier in the Big Ten? Yeah, he did a really good job, so I'm going to go home now. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I'll amplify a little bit on it. So, I mean, you can't really uh, 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 estimate, you know, you have to look at the bigger picture of um, what was happening in the Civil War in July of 1864 when you consider the importance of what happened here at Fort Stevens. And, you know, it, the, the war has been dragging on, you know, for three years. The nation is war-weary. President Lincoln's popularity, they didn't have Gallup polls back then, but Lincoln's popularity was in the toilet. You know, he barely, the other thing you have to remember is that this war, uh, the Civil War was fought, well, it was the only Civil War in the history of the world that was fought during a Democratic presidential election, the election of 1864. And it was by no means a done deal that Lincoln was going to get reelected. Remember, he barely got the nomination in the Republican Party. He wasn't even at the convention. Well, back then they didn't go. Conventions actually chose presidential candidates back then. Can you believe it? Remember the, you know, behind closed doors and all that stuff. And Lincoln was famously in the White House at the telegraph office when he got a, a telegraph saying, oh, by the way, you got the nomination. And then what did he do? He picked a Democrat to run with him, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee. Um, he was anti-secession, but he was pro-slavery. So that's how desperate Lincoln was. Um, the Democrats were d divided, but they were also united against uh, Lincoln. And who did they choose to run against Lincoln? Anybody know? General Wallace? McClellan. General McClellan, who he had fired after screwing up at the Battle of Antietam. And so uh, um, Lincoln, uh, you know, his popularity is in the toilet. He, one example was he, he wrote a letter to his cabinet telling them, uh, you know, to be gracious after the election and cooperate with the new administration. So that's the background here. Consider what would have happened if you had you know, you had a Confederate force of, what, 13,000 troops had just defeated Lew Wallace at Monocacy, 35 miles from here. And their intention was not clear. In fact, they sent, there are 15,000 Confederate troops at Monocacy. They sent 2,000 north to Baltimore for two reasons, as a feint to confuse people about what their next move was going to be. because. Uh, Jubal Early's orders were to proceed to attack Washington if he had the chance to do it. But it was a secret order. In fact, it was so secret, Robert E. Lee sent it up by, he didn't put it on the telegraph. He sent his son, Rob Lee, with the order on his horse who rode from Richmond all the way up to Antietam, which was where Early and his men were camped before they went to Monocacy. So they sent the, the cavalry north to confuse people in Washington, and secondly, to cut off the railroads and the telegraph. So <laughs> word gets in that Wallace is defeated at Monocacy, and they're cut off, and the rumors start flying, and there's 13,000 lean and hungry Confederate troops on the way to Washington. As has been said, Washington was woefully under-defended at this point. You know, especially considering that, you know, Virginia was part of the, the enemy. Washington's 90 miles from Washington, from Richmond. Um, in, in 1861, after the Battle of Manassas, 35 miles from here, which was a huge defeat for the Union, somebody said, we better defend Washington, D.C. So that's when they started building the defenses of Washington. They started it in 61. By this point in the war, it was finished. Washington was surrounded by, what was it, 68 forts. They were, they were uh, connected by berms and embankments, and as you can see by reconstructed Fort Stevens. They weren't big, 
they were defensive forts. They were like in a horseshoe pointing out. And don't forget, we're in farmland here. Washington back then was there. We're out in Nowheresville. Um, and so they did bristle with cannon, though, as you've seen pictures, and you can see a few here. But they were woefully underdefended. You know, Washington, I think you know, was more or less a giant hospital in July of 64. Government buildings, Georgetown University churches, you know, were used to to uh, treat the wounded Union soldiers. And the bulk of the troops were down outside of Richmond and Petersburg, encircling Lee, who had hunkered down um, after the Wilderness Campaign. So, um, who was here? These, these barricades were designed to be manned by something like 35,000 troops. There couldn't have been more than a couple of thousand. They were made up of 100 days men, people who had never fired a shot in anger. They joined just for 100 days. They were made, made up, uh, they were, uh, the other people who were out here were uh, what was called the Veteran Reserve Corps. Uh, they had changed the name because their previous name was not exactly flattering. It was called the Invalid Corps. So there was a bunch of invalids, and then the word went out when they heard that Early was on the way to Washington for anybody with a weapon to come out here and the other forts. So like they said, they were clerks from the State Department. Um, I did a talk at the GPO a couple of years ago, and they're very proud of the fact that there were GPO employed, government printers who came out here to defend. So the word motley has been used to describe who was defending Washington, D.C. with Jubal Early and, you know, 15,000 lean and hungry and mean Confederate troops on the way. And what were the implications? Yes. All right, sir. He said, shut up and go home. No. No. Keep on talking. He said, keep on talking. That's easy for me. I just press a button. So, so uh, where was I? Um, Right. Consider what could have, it look. Historians don't. Thank you. Historians don't like what ifs, but the what ifs here are, you know, pretty astounding. Lincoln's popularity is in the toilet. Um, can you know? Wait. Correct me. Did they have Twitter back then? No. But word would have gotten out pretty quickly. You know that war was very heavily covered by the newspapers and the, and the news magazines that, that uh, Confederates on the loose in Washington, there was the Treasury Department to be raided. There were stores, uh, you know, you name it. And, you know, the British burned Washington in 1814 during the War of 1812. It wasn't beyond the, you know, it, it, it very likely could have happened. And we have invalids defending the place. So Grant, by the way, knew what Early was up to at this point. And, you know, you can read the, the, le the, the, the letters, not their letters, you can read the journals, you can read the official records of OR, and Lee's lieutenants, uh, Grant's lieutenants are saying, uh, General Grant, you know, Washington is going to be under attack. Now, just to go back a minute, one of the reasons that Lee sent Early away from Richmond in the beginning with an entire corps of troops was to get Grant to react, right? He wanted... He knew that Grant had him with men, materiel, money, whatever. They were surrounded. It was going to happen. But, and so he sent a corps of troops away. They kicked the Union troops out of the Shenandoah Valley, which was the Confederate breadbasket, right? And they got supplies of food coming in. Then they marched, like you said, down the Shenandoah River, meaning north because the river flows backward. They crossed the Potomac on July 5th. They stopped to rest out there in Antietam, and then they headed down this way. And so, um, I just lost my train of thought on that one, too. But, um, Point Lookout was another part. Uh, that's right. Part of the order was to liberate 12,000 Confederate prisoners at Camp Lookout, which is what? Southern Maryland, as the crow flies, what? 20, 30 miles from here. But, of course, to get there, they would have had a, that, that plan was abandoned. Um, but they, but early it got here on the morning of uh, July 11th. Remember, the Battle of Monocacy was at July 9th. It was hotter than blazes. You know, I mean, like today's a cool day in July, right, compared to what it was. And they were wearing wool uniforms. I don't know how they did it. They've been on the march since June 13th, the Confederate troops. Um, 
So they had a rest on the battlefield after. 1,300 Union casualties at Monocacy, killed, wounded, prisoner. Uh, about 800 uh, Confederate. They rest, unlike Early, who's a hard charger. I mean, he's one of, the, one of the most aggressive Confederate generals. But he knew he had to rest the men. Uh, then they started coming this way. They came through, um, they came down Route 355, which was there today. You know, it's like the uh, Urbana Turnpike, Rockville Turnpike, Wisconsin Avenue. They came right down through Silver Spring. And they came here, and you know, on the morning of July 11th, 1864, Eubory was out there in the woods, on his horse, with his glass, looking right down that way. He could see the Capitol Dome in his glass. And he had to make the decision of whether to uh, attack or not. So what I was getting at was that Grant, when he, when he finally, finally gave in, Grant finally gave in, and he sent the rest of the six Corps troops up here. You know, they marched to City Point, they got on ships, they went down the James River, they came up the Potomac, they landed at the old docks downtown. They came up and they started to go toward Georgetown. And some, oh, but when the citizens of Washington were out there, greeting them with ice cream and sandwiches and saying, thank you, we've been saved. And these six Corps troops were veterans of the Wilderness Campaign. These were hardened Yankee troops, completely different from the invalids, etc., who were here. So then they got their bearings. They marched up the 7th Street Pike, a.k.a. Georgia Avenue, and they arrived here just before Early did. And the Six Corps had a distinctive, I think it was white cross on their sleeve. So when Early also looked, he saw Six Corps troops here. And he knew, because it was so bleeding hot, his troops were strung out all the way back to Rockville. So maybe he started out with 12,000, but he left a bunch to take care of the prisoners. He, um, so they, they, they were skirmishing. The Union sent out some squads, and there was fighting in Rock, right downtown Rockville, etc. So he camped out here. They did have their artillery, and he didn't attack, but there was skirmishing and artillery going back and forth on July 11th. They took a council of war that night at the Blair House, not the Blair House downtown, but the Blair House in Silver Spring. It belonged to Montgomery Blair, who was the Postmaster General of the United States, a chum of Lincoln's. The, the Blair family had fled. They went fishing in Pennsylvania. And uh, so he had a council of war with his generals, who included John Breckinridge, who was former Vice President of the United States, who had actually been to Blair's house and knew where the wine cellar was. So the Confederate generals drank up the Blair's wine, and they decided uh, on, the, on the 12th, they would decide what to do. They came back again, again. He saw the, the guns in the Sixth Corps. There was more firing, uh, and there were approximately, the official records are not clear, but we think there were about 400 Union casualties killed, wounded, and taken prisoner. Like they said, 44 of them are buried right up here in the smallest I think it's the smallest national cemetery in the country on Georgia Avenue. The rest were, you know, sent home their homes to be buried. We don't know the Confederate dead. It never made the official record, but I have a feeling it was more. So when the when the uh, Union troops got up on the morning of, of July 13th, 1864, and looked out, the Confederates were gone. In the middle of the night, Early packed it up. He went back out to Silver Spring. He went out to Poolsville. He came south and he crossed the Potomac at White's Ferry uh, on July 13, 1864. And I'm almost finished. So uh, that's in a nutshell why they call the Battle of Monocacy the battle that saved Washington, D.C. And why what, what, um, what, what Lee did, that plan that he did, he did get Grant to take his troops away from Richmond and Petersburg. The war did end, we know that, for the very same reason, but that was in March of 1865. Who knows how many months, how, many, how much bloodshed would have been avoided uh, had Lee not done that and Grant moved in. So that's, uh, oh, the, only, the, the one thing I like to tell people to remember, if they're going to remember one thing about monocacy vis-a-vis -vis Fort Stevens and what ifs, is that Jubal early was one day late. Ta-da. <laughs> question.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, remember, that's a good question. Lincoln was here both days. So were the people from Washington, right? We're in Washington, D.C., yes. But back then, this was really not considered Washington. It was down that way. And just like as happened in the first Battle of Manassas, when people didn't realize what the hell was going on, they came out, picnicked to watch the battle. They did the same thing here. And Lincoln came out, you know, all six foot four of them and stovepipe half. There's a plaque up there on the, on the rampart where he was standing and a Confederate sharpshooter in the trees at the old Walter Reed, who was pretty far away, uh, shot and wounded a Union surgeon standing right next to Lou, Lou Wallace. He made me say Lou Wallace, Gary. Standing right next to Lincoln. At which point it was decided that Lincoln better better get down. And the, the, the story that came out, and it, by the way, it didn't come see the light of day until the 1930s, was that Oliver Wendell Holmes, who indeed was a Union lieutenant and was here, said to his commanding commander-in-chief, get down, you fool. And somehow it's repeated over and over again. Somebody who's written an entire, I wrote, you know, Half of, a, half of a chapter on that alone, but somebody's written an entire skinny book about how that didn't happen. Um, somebody said something to the president that, you know, not a good idea, that Dr. Jones over here just got shot, right? So, anyway. Yes? yes. You have the hook? Yeah, I have the hook. Okay. And a sound. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. One more, more question? Uh, no, I, I'm a next speaker's here, and we're ready to start the next part of our program. Okay, then. I'll Thank take, you very I'll much. Take it off stage. It will take questions off-site. Thank you very much, Mark. Okay, thanks, everybody.